Chapter 6 Stop Fuming and Fretting Many people make life unnecessarily difficult for themselves by dissipating power and energy through fuming and fretting. Do you ever fume and fret? Here is a picture of yourself if you do. The word fume means to boil up, to blow off, to emit vapor, to be agitated, to be distraught, to sit sethi. The word fret is equally des descriptive. It is reminiscent of a sick child in the night, a, a pe petulant half cry, half whine. It ceases, only to begin again. It has an irritating, annoying, penetrating quality. To fret is a childish term, but it describes the emotional reaction of many adults. The Bible advises us to fret not thyself. Psalm 37 1. This is sound advice for the people of our time. We need to stop fuming and fretting and get peaceful if we are to have power to live effectively. And how do we go about doing so? The first step is to reduce your pace or at least the tempo of your pace. We do not realize how accelerated the rate of our, li our lives has become or the speed at which we are driving ourselves. Many people are destroying their physical bodies by this pace. But what is even more tragic, they are tearing their minds and souls to shreds as well. It is possible for a person to live a quiet existence physically and yet maintain a high tempo emotionally. Even an invalid, even an invalid can live at too high a pace from that standpoint. The character of our thoughts determines pace when the mind goes rushing on pell-mell from the from one feverish attitude to another, it becomes feverish, and the result is a state bordering on petulance. The pace of modern life must be reduced if we are not to suffer profoundly from its debilitating overstimulation and superexcitement. This overstimulation produces toxic poisons in the body and creates emotional illness. It produces fragile it produces fatigue, excuse me, and a sense of frustration so we so that we fume and fret about everything from our personal troubles to the state of the nation and the world. If the effect of, the, of this emotional disquiet is so pronounced physically, what must its effect be on that deep inner essence of the personality known as the soul? It is impossible to have peace of soul if the pace is so feverishly accelerated. God won't go that fast. He will not endeavor to keep up with you. He says in effect, go ahead if you must with this foolish pace and when you are worn out I will offer my healing. But I can make your life so rich if you will slow down now and live and move and have your being in me. God moves in perpetual perpetually slowly and with perfect organization the only wise rate at which to live is God's rate God gets things done and they are done right and he does them without hurry he neither fumes nor frets he is peaceful and therefore efficient this same peace is offered to us peace I leave with you my peace I give unto you John fourteen twenty seven. In a sense, this is a pathetic generation, especially in the great cities because of the effect of nervous tension, synthetic excitement, and noise. But the malady, malady extends into the country districts also, for the airwaves transmit tension. I was amused by an old lady who, in talking about this matter, said, Life is so daily. That remark certainly spoke volumes about the pressure, responsibilities, and tension of daily life. Its persistent, insistent demand upon us is provocative of pressure. One wonders whether this generation of Americans is not so accustomed to tension that they are in the unhappy state of not being comfortable without it. The deep 
quietness of woods and valleys so well known to our forefathers is an unaccustomed state to them the temple of their lives is such that in many instances they have an incapacity to draw upon the sources of peace and quietness with the physical world offer, which the physical world offers one summer afternoon my wife and i went for a long walk in the woods we were stopping at the beautiful lake mohonk mountain house which is set in one of the finest natural parks in america seventy five hundred acres of virgin mountainside in the middle of which is a lake lying like a gem in the forest the word mohonk means lake in the sky aliens ago e eons ago some giant upheaval of the earth cast up these sheer cliffs you come out of the deep woods onto some noble promontory and rest your eyes on great valleys set among hills rock ribbled and ancient as the sun these woods mountains and valleys constitute what ought to be a sure retreat from every confusion of this world on this afternoon as we walked there was a mixture of summer showers in sunlit hours we were drenched and started to fret about it a, a bit because it took the press out of our clothes then we told each other that it doesn't hurt a human being to get drenched in, with clean rainwater that the rain feels cool and fresh on one's face and that you can always sit in the sun and dry yourself off we walked under the trees and talked and then fell silent we were listening, listening deeply to the quietness. In a strict sense, the woods are never still. There is tremendous activity always in process, but nature makes no strident noises regardless of the vastness of its operation. Nature's sounds are quiet, harmonious. On this beautiful afternoon, nature was, la was laying its hand of healing quietness upon us we could actually feel the tension being drawn off just as we were falling under this spell the faint sounds of what passes for music came to us it was nervous high-strung music of the jitterbug variety presently through the woods came three young people two young pe two young women and a young man and the latter was lugging a portable radio they were three young city people out for a walk in the woods and tragically enough were bringing their noise along with them they were nice young folk too for they stopped and we had a pleasant talk with them it occurred to me to ask them to turn that thing off and listen to the music of the woods but i didn't feel it was my business to instruct them and they finally and finally they went on their way we commented on the loss they were incurring that they could pass through this peacefulness and not give ear to the music that is as old as the world harmony and melody the like of which man has never equal equalled the song of the wind through the trees the sweet notes of birds singing their hearts out the whole background of the music of the spears this is still to be found in America in our woods and great plains, in our valleys, in our mountain majesties, and where the ocean foams on soft shores of sand. We should avail ourselves of its healing. Remember the words of Jesus. Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. Mark 6.31 Even as I write these words and give you this good advice, I recall instances where it has been necessary to remind myself to practice the same truth, which emphasizes that we must everlastingly discipline ourselves to quietness if we expect its benefits in our lives. <coughs> One autumn day, Mrs. Peak and I took a trip into Massachusetts to see our son John at Deerfield Academy. We told him we would arrive at 11 a.m., and we pride ourselves on the good old American customs, custom of promptness. 
Therefore, being a bit behind schedule, we were driving at breakneck speed through the autumnal landscape. My wife said, Norman, did you see that radiant hillside? What hillside? I asked. It just went by on the other side, she explained. Look at that beautiful tree. What tree? I was already a mile past it. This is one of the most glorious days I have ever seen, my wife said. How could you possibly imagine such amazing colors as these New England hillsides in October? In fact, she said, it makes me happy inside. That remark of hers so impressed me that I stopped the car and went back a quarter of a mile to a lake backed by towering hills dressed in autumn colors. We sat and looked and meditated. God, with his genius and skill, had painted that scene in the varied colors which he alone can mix. In the still waters of the lake lay a reflected vision of his glory, for the hillside was unforgettably pictured in that mirror-like pond. For quite a while we sat without a word until finally my wife broke the silence by the only appropriate statement that one could make. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Psalm 23, 2 We arrived at Deerfield at 11, but we were not tired. In fact, we were deeply refreshed. To help reduce this tension, which seems to dominate our people everywhere, you can start by reducing your own pace. To, to do that, you will need to slow down. Quiet down. Do not fume. Do not fret. Practice being peaceful. Practice the peace of God which passeth all understanding. Philippians 4, 7. Then note the quiet power sense that wells up within you. A friend of mine who was compelled to take an enforced rest as a result of pressure wrote me, Many lessons have been learned during this enforced retreat. Now I know better than before that in the quiet we become aware of his presence. Life can get muddled, but muddied water, says Lael Taz, Taz, let stand, will become clear. A physician gave some rather whimsical advice to a patient, an aggressive, go-getter type of businessman. Excitingly, he told the doctor what an enormous amount of work he had to do and that he had to get it done right away, quick or else. I take my briefcase home every night, and it's packed with work, he said with nervous infliction. Why do you take work home with you at night, the doctor asked quietly. I have to get it done, he fumed. Cannot someone else do it or help you with it, asked the doctor. No, the man snapped. I'm the only one who can do it. It must be done just right, and I alone can do it as, as it must be done, and it has to be done quickly. Everything depends upon me. If I write you a prescription, will you follow it? asked the doctor. This, believe it or not, was the prescription. His patient was to take off two hours every working day and go for a long walk. Then he was to take off a half day a week and spend that half day in a cemetery. In astonishment, the patient demanded, Why should I spend a half day in a cemetery? Because, answered the doctor, I want you to wander around and look at the gravestones of men who are there permanently. I want you to meditate on the fact that many of them are there because they thought, even as you do, that the whole world rested on their shoulders. Meditate on the solemn fact that when you get there permanently, the world will go on just the same and, as important as you are, others will be able to do the work you are now doing. I suggest that you sit on one of those tombstones and repeat this statement. A thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Psalm 9040 The patient got the idea. He slowed his pace. He learned to delegate authority. He achieved a proper sense of his own importance. He stopped fuming and fretting. He got peaceful. 
and it might be added he does better work. He is developing a more competent organization, and he admits that his business is in better condition. A prominent manufacturer was afflicted with tension. In fact, he was in a very high, strong frame of mind. As he himself described it, he leapt out of bed every morning and immediately got himself into high gear. He was in such a rush and dither that he made his breakfast on soft-boiled eggs because they slid down fast. This hectic pace left him fagged and worn at about midday. He sank into bed every night exhausted. It so happens that his home is situated in a grove of trees. Very early one morning, unable to sleep, he arose and sat by the window. He became interested in watching a bird emerge from his night's sleep. He noticed that a bird sleeps with his head under his wing. The feathers pull all around himself. When he awakened, he pulled his bill out from under his feathers, took a sleepy look around, stretched one leg to its full length, meanwhile stretching the wing over the leg until it spread it out like a fan. He pulled the leg and wing back and then repeated the same process with the other leg and wing, whereupon he put his head down in his feathers again for a delicious little cat nap, only in this case a bird nap. Then the head came out again. This time the bird looked around eagerly, threw his neck back, gave his wings and legs two more big stretches, then he, set, then he sent up a song, a thrilling, melodic song of praise to the day, wherewith he hopped down off the limb, got himself a drink of cold water, and started looking for food. My high-strung friend said to himself, if that's the way the birds get up, sort of slow and easy like, why wouldn't it be a good method for me to start the day that way? He actually went through the same performance, even to singing, and noticed that the song was an especially beneficial factor, that it was a releasing mechanism. I can't sing, he chuckled, but I practiced sitting quietly in a chair and singing. Mostly I sang hymns and happy songs. Imagine me singing. But I did. My wife thought I was bare, barefoot of my senses. The only thing I had on the bird was that I did a little praying too. Then, like the bird, I felt like some food, and I wanted a good breakfast, bacon and eggs, and I took my time eating it. After that, I went to work in a released frame of mind. It surely did start me off for the for the day minus the tension, and it helped me go through the day in a peaceful and relaxed manner. A former member of a championship university crew told me that their shrewd crew coach often reminded them to win this or any race row slowly. He pointed out that rapid rowing tends to break the stroke, and when the stroke is broken, it is with the greatest difficulty that a crew recovers the rhythm necessarily to, necessary to win. Meanwhile, other crews pass the disorganized group. It is indeed wise advice to go fast, row slowly. In order to row slowly or to work slowly and maintain the steady pace that wins, the victim of high tempo will do well to get the coordinating the coordinating piece of God into his mind, his soul, and it might be added into his nerves and muscles also. Have you ever considered the importance of having the peace of God in your muscles and your joints? Perhaps your joints will not pain so much when they have the peace of God in them. Your muscles will work with correlation when the peace of God who created them governs their action. Speak to your muscles every day, and to your joints, and to your nerves, saying, Fret not thyself, Psalm 37, 1. Relax on a couch or bed. Think of each important muscle from head to feet, and say to each, The peace of God is touching you. Then practice feeling that peace 
throughout your entire body and do core and do course your muscles and joints will take heed slow down for whatever you really want will be there when you get there if you work toward it without stress without pressure without pressing if proceeding under God's guidance and in his smooth and unhurried tempo it is not there then it was not supposed to be there if you miss it perhaps you should have missed it so definitely seek to develop a normal natural God ordered pace practice and preserve mental quiet learn the art <clears throat> learn the art of letting go all nervous excitement to do this stop at intervals and affirm I now relinquish nervous excitement it is flowing from me I am at peace do not fume do not fret practice being peaceful to attain this efficient state of living I recommend the practice of thinking peaceful thoughts every day we perform a series of acts designed to care for the body properly we bathe brush the teeth take exercise in similar fashion we should give time and planned effort to keeping the mind in a healthy state one way to do this is to sit quietly and pass a series of peaceful thoughts through the mind <clears throat> for for example pass through the thoughts the memory of a lofty mountain a misty valley a sun speckled trout stream silver moonlight on water at least once in every 24 hours preferably in the busiest part of the day deliberately stop whatever you are doing for 10 or 15 minutes and practice serenity there are times when it is essential re resolutely to check our headlong pace and it must be emphasized that the only way to stop is to stop I went to a certain city on a lecture date and I was met at the train by a commit committee I was rushed to a bookstore where I had an autographing party and then to another bookstore where another autographing party was held and they rushed me to a luncheon after brushing through the luncheon I was rushed to a meeting after the meeting I was rushed back to the hotel where I changed my clothes and was rushed to a reception where I met several hundred people and drank three glasses of fruit punch then I was rushed back to the hotel and told I had 20 minutes to dress for dinner when I was getting dressed the telephone rang and somebody said hurry hurry we must rush down to dinner excitingly I chattered I will rush right down I rushed from the room and was so excited that I could scarcely get the key into the lock hastily I, I felt myself to be sure that I was completely dressed and rushed toward the elevator all of a sudden I stopped I was out of breath I asked myself what is this all about what is the meaning of this ceaseless rush this is ridiculous then I declared independence and said I do not care if I go to dinner I do not care whether I make a talk I do not have to go to this dinner and I do not have to make a speech so deliberately and slowly I walked back to my room and took my time about unlocking the door I telephoned the man downstairs and said if you want to eat go ahead if you want to save a place for me I will be down after a while but I am NOT going to rush any more so I removed my coat sat down took off my shoes put my feet up on the table and just sat then I opened the Bible and very slowly read aloud the hundred and twenty-first Psalm I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help I closed the book and had a little talk with myself saying come on now start living a little slower start living a slower and more relaxed life and then I can affirmed God is here and his peace is touching me I do not need anything to eat I reasoned I eat too much anyways 
Besides, the dinner will probably not be very good. And if I am quiet now, I will give a better speech at eight o'clock. So I sat there resting and praying for fifteen minutes. I shall never forget the sense of peace and personal mastery I had when I walked out of that room. I had the glorious feeling of having overcome something, of having taken control of myself emotionally, and when I reached the dining room, the others had just finished the first course. All I missed was the soup, which by general consent was no great loss. This incident was an amazing experience of the healing presence of God. I gained these values by simply stopping, by quietly reading the Bible, by sincerely praying, and by thinking some peaceful thoughts for a few moments. Physicians generally seem to feel that much physical trouble could be avoided or overcome by practicing the philosophy and methodology of not fuming or fretting. A prominent citizen of New York told me that his doctor suggested that he come to our clinic at the church because, said his physician, you need to develop a calm philosophy of living. Your power resources are played out. My doctor says I am pushing myself to the limit. He tells me I'm too tense, too high strung, that I fume and fret too much. And he concluded, my doctor declares the only sure cure is for to develop what he calls a calm philosophy of living. My visitor rose and paced the floor, then demanded, but how in the world can I do that? It's a lot easier said than done. Then this exciting gentleman went on to say that his doctor had given him certain suggestions for developing this calm philosophy of living. The suggestions as outlined were indeed wise. But then, he explained, the doctor suggested that I see people here at church where he feels that if I learn to use religious faith in a practical manner, it will give me peace of mind and bring down my blood pressure. Then I will feel better physically. While I realize the doctor's prescription is sensible, he complained, how can a man 50 years old of a high-strung nature such as mine suddenly change the habits of a lifetime and develop this so-called calm philosophy of living. That did indeed seem to be a problem, for he was a bundle of excitable and explosive nerves. He paced the floor, he thumbed the table, his voice was high-pitched, he gave the impression of a thoroughly disturbed and baffled man. Obviously, he was showing up at his worst but he was clearly revealing the inner state of his personality and the insight thus gained gave us a chance to help him through understanding him better. As I listened to his words and observed his attitude, I again understood why Jesus Christ retains his remarkable hold on men. It is because he has the answer to such problems as this, and I proved that fact by suddenly changing the line of the, commun of the conversation. Without any introductory words, I began to recite certain Bible texts such as, Come unto me, all ye that labor, and the heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew 11:28. And again, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. John fourteen twenty seven, and still again, thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. Isaiah twenty six three. I recited these words slowly, deliberately, reflectively. As this reciting went on, I noticed that my visitor stopped being agitated. Quietness came over him, and then we both sat in silence. It seemed that we sat for so we sat so for several minutes. Perhaps it wasn't that long, but finally he took a deep breath. Why what's why that's funny, he said. I feel a lot better. Isn't that queer? I guess it was those words that did it. No, not the words alone, I answered, though they do have a remarkable effect upon the mind, but something deeper happened just then. 
he touched you a minute ago. The physician with the healing touch. He was present in this room. My visitor evidenced no surprise at this assertion, but eagerly and impetuously agreed, and conviction was written on his face. That's right, he sure was. I felt him. I see what you mean. Now I understand. Jesus Christ will help me develop a calm philosophy of living. This man found what increasing thousands are presently discovering, that a simple faith in and practice of the principles and techniques of Christianity brings peace and quietness and therefore new power to body, mind, and spirit. It is the perfect antidote to fuming and to fretting. It helps a person to become peaceful and thus to tap new resources of strength. Of course, it was necessary to teach this man a new pattern of thinking and acting. This was done in part by suggesting literature written by experts in the, fear, in the field of spiritual culture. For example, we gave him lessons <clears throat> in the skill of church going. We showed him how to make church worship a therapy. He was instructed in the scientific use of prayer and relaxation. And as a result of this practice, eventually he became a healthy man. <clears throat> Anyone willing to follow this program and sincerely put these principles into day-by-day -day practice can, I believe, develop inner peace and power. Many of these techniques are outlined in this book. In attaining emotional control, the daily practice of healing techniques is of first importance. Emotional control cannot be gained in any magical or easy way. You cannot develop it by merely reading a book, although that is often useful. The only sure method is by working at it regularly, persistently, scientifically, and by developing creative faith. I suggest that you begin with such a primary procedure as simply the practice of keeping physically still. Don't pace the floor. Don't wring your hands. Don't pound or shout or argue or walk up and down. Don't let yourself get worked up into a dither. In excitement, one's physical movements become accentuated. Therefore, begin at the simplest place, that is by ceasing physical movement. Stand still, sit down, lie down. Certainly keep the voice down to a low pitch. In developing a calm control, it is necessary to think calmness. For the body responds sensitively to the type of thoughts that pass through the mind. It is also true that the mind can be quieted by first making the body quiet. That is to say, a physical attitude can induce desired mental attitudes. In a speech, I related the following incident which occurred in a committee meeting I attended. A gentleman who heard me tell the story was greatly impressed by it and took its truth to heart. He tried the technique suggested in reports that it has been very effective in controlling his fuming and fretting. I was in a meeting where a discussion was going on which finally became rather bitter. Tempers were becoming frayed and some of the participants were decidedly on edge. Sharp remarks were passed. Suddenly, one man arose, deliberately took off his coat, opened his collar, and lay down upon a couch. All were astonished, and someone asked if he felt ill. No, he said, I feel fine. But I am beginning to get mad, and I have learned that it is difficult to get mad laying down. We all laughed, and the tension was broken. When our whimsical friend went on to explain that he had tried a little trick with himself, he had a quick temper, and when he felt himself getting mad, he found that he was clenching his fist and raising his voice. So he deliberately extended his fingers, not allowing them to form into a fist. In proportion to the raising of his tension or anger, he, he depressed his voice and talked in exaggerated low tones. You cannot carry on an argument in a whisper, he said with a grin. This principle can be effective in controlling emotional excitements, fretting, and tension. As many have discovered by experimentation, 
A beginning step, therefore, in achieving calmness is to discipline your physical reactions. You will be surprised at how quickly this can reduce the heat of your emotions. And when emotional heat is driven off, fuming and fretting subside, you will be amazed at the energy and power you will save. You will be much less tired. It is, moreover, a good procedure to practice being phlegmatic or apathetic, even, even indifferent. To a certain extent, even practice being sluggish. People thus constituted are less likely to emotional breaks. Highly organized individuals may do well to cultivate these reactions to a degree at least. Naturally, one does not want to lose, lose the keen, sensitive responsiveness characteristic of the highly organized individual. But the practice of being phlegmatic tends to bring such a keyed up personality to a balanced emotional position. Following is a technique consisting of six points which I have personally found of great helpfulness in reducing the tendency to, to fume and fret. I have suggested its use to countless people who practice it and find it of great value. 1. Sit relaxed in a chair. Completely yield yourself to the chair, starting with your toes and proceeding to the top of your head. Conceive of every portion of the body as relaxing. Affirm relaxation by saying, My toes are relaxed. My fingers. My facial muscles. 2. Think of your mind as the surface of a lake in a storm tossed by waves and in tumult. But now the waves subside and the surface of the lake is placid and unruffled. 3. Spend two or three minutes thinking of the most beautiful and peaceful scenes you have ever beheld as, for example, a mountain at sunset, or a deep valley filled with the hush of early morning, or a woods at noonday, or moonlight upon rippling waters. In memory, relive these scenes. 4. Repeat slowly, quietly bringing out the melody in each a series of words which express quietness and peace, as for example, A. Tranquility. Say it very deliberately and in a tranquil manner. B. Serenity. C. Quietness. Think of other such words and repeat them. 5. Make a mental list of times in your life when you have been conscious of God's watchful care and recall how, when you were worried and anxious, he brought things out right and took care of you. Then recite aloud this line from an old hymn. So long thy power hath kept me, sure it still will lead me on. 6. Repeat the following, which has an amazing power to relax and quiet the mind. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. Isaiah 26, 3. Repeat this several times during the day, whenever you have a fraction of a moment. Repeat it aloud if possible, so that by the end of the day, you will have said it many times. Conceive of these words as active, vital substances, permeating your mind sending into every area of your thinking a healing balm. This is the best known medicine for taking tension from the mind. As you work with the techniques suggested in this chapter, the tendency to fume and fret will gradually be modified. In direct proportion to your progress, the power hitherto drawn off by this unhappy habit will be felt in your increased ability to meet life's responsibilities.